Welcome to our service this morning. I invite you to join me in our call to worship. Christ is risen and greets us with peace. The peace of Christ is among us indeed. We are witnessing witnesses of God's glory and steadfast love. The transforming love of Christ is among us indeed. Come, let us worship. We worship with our opening hymn, Worship Christ the Risen King, number 361. <laughs> within us, and for your grace to be revealed in you daily. Be with us and awaken within us the call to love one another in the way it was made real through Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. We come now as we make our prayer of confession this morning. Ever-present God, forgive us when we stand in disbelief and comfort us when our fears outweigh your peace. God, forgive us when we become too busy to pray. Help us when we fail to see our neighbors in need. Abiding God, forgive us when we are overwhelmed with bad news and shut down completely. In these times, remind us that we are called to be your love lived, your faithful witnesses, and your humble services. Help us to wake up to the work of love and to your renewing strength each day. We pray. Amen. Please join me in a moment of silent reflection. O oh God, hear our prayers of repentance and forgiveness, and awaken us from doubt, disbelief, and distress by transforming us into your resurrection joy. God, we desire for your loving spirit to be among us, to comfort us in our fears, and to renew us in our faith. Amen. Thank you. 
come down, we will lift up our joys and concerns to God. Let us pray. Lord, we ask for the courage of the Good Shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. We pray for those prepared to suffer and even die for what they believe in. We pray for them, those whose lives are rights are sacrificed in the name of power and greed. We pray for those who risk themselves by accompanying others along the path of deep suffering through valleys of fear and despair. Lord, we ask for the compassion of the Good Shepherd, who leads his sheep to safe pasture. We pray for those who work to feed and shelter and educate the poor peoples of our world. We pray for those skilled at nursing and healing and those who are suffering or ill in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for those who care for the victims of our society, those unable to cope with life, the neglected, the abused. Lord, we ask for the love of the Good Shepherd who knows his sheep by name. We pray for our church, for our minister, for all the officers of the church, for all those engaged in pastoral care. We pray for those we know, relatives and friends who are facing difficult times. I ask you to lift up the names of those who need our prayers right now. We pray for Sandy, who is still recovering, for Jackie, who will be having surgery this Wednesday. Who else needs it? For Jan, we pray continued prayers for Jan. And for Dottie, continued prayers for Dottie. Who else needs our prayers this morning? Yeah. Yes, I know you have a prayer you'd like to lift up. For Joyce Siraj, her husband Joe passed away while they were on vacation in North Carolina. North Carolina, He fell and hit his head. So prayers for that family. Are there others at this time? Yes. For, for Ken, Ken and Audrey Colby. Yes, continued prayers for them. Yes. For your brother, Kevin, we will definitely hold you, him and your family in our prayers as he found out he has predicting less than a year as he has an aggressive form of cancer. So we hold him and your family in our prayers. Anyone else at this time? And I ask prayers, uh, Clint and I are going on vacation, so I ask you to keep us in our prayer, your prayers as we travel this week. And God, we pray for ourselves that we might hear the call from God, the Good Shepherd, and follow his way of love. We make all our prayers, those spoken and those unspoken, in Christ's name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'm going to instruct you to put your bulletins away, because the verses in the bulletin are not the verses I'm going to be using. So the first reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Tobias, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priest's family. 
when they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. And the Gospel reading comes from the Gospel attributed to John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the Good Shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf, snatches them, and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I receive this command from my Father. The word of the Lord. Please join in singing our hymn number 370, Rejoice the Lord is King. Please rise. gentle shepherd with brown hair and blue eyes snuggling a sheep. It's the first image that comes to mind when we speak of the good shepherd, and there is nothing inherently wrong with that. The image is everywhere in Christianity. I've seen it in so many of the churches I've gone to. It's been on stained glass windows or in 
pictures hanging in the hallway. It's everywhere. Of course, there is a lot missing from this kind of picture. Think about a shepherd for a moment. He is supposed to be working outside. And in our picture, there is a surprising lack of dirt. Our picture doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who would smell like sheep, dung, or body odor. I wouldn't expect to see him trudging through the rocky Palestinian hills in search of a passy patch of grass with a bunch of stubborn sheep. If we think about where the man in the picture belongs, it is more likely in a field of wildflowers with happy, frolicking lambs bouncing around him as music swells in the background. In fact, I'm not sure I trust that man in our picture as a shepherd. He looks too much like an average Joe to be any good at such a hard scrabble job. But we see these images of the doe-eyed shepherd cuddling a tiny helpless lamb or carrying one over his shoulder. And it's a comforting and nostalgic image for us. We immediately begin to think of Psalm 23, perhaps, of never wanting for anything, of having a banquet table prepared for us in the presence of our enemies, of still waters and green pastures. It's an image of gentle power, of someone who can control the uncontrollable in our world. And isn't that what we want of Jesus? We want Jesus to tame what is wild and unruly in the world, who with the crook of his staff can solve what is unsolvable and answer what is unanswerable in life, who can protect and defend against the thieves and bandits of this world, who come only to steal, kill, and destroy. Regardless of what we want, though, we eventually come face to face with the reality of the world is still wild and unruly, that there are still questions without answers, that there are still thieves and bandits in the world bent on destruction. We have seen an escalation in violence recently, unfortunately. In these past months, there has been an increase in mass shootings. And we've been in the midst recently of the trial of Officer Chauvin for the killing of Derek Floyd. And during that shoot, during that trial, we learned of the shooting of 13-year-old Adam Toledo by another officer. And there has been great violence against the Asian American community. Where was the Good Shepherd in the midst of all this violence? In the midst of shootings and escalation, in the midst of, of violence against people of color in our own streets? Where is the shepherd that will sanitize all that is wrong with the world, who will clean up all that is messy and misplaced in our lives? I asked myself these questions as I read over the text, and it struck me that these questions come from a misreading of the Good Shepherd passage in John. Because we are asking to do is live in the walled off reality of the sheepfold. The sheepfold was essentially a secure pen in the wilderness constructed of large stone. It kept the sheep safe and was guarded by a gatekeeper while the shepherd was away. I'd always assumed over these years that the shepherd was leading the flock to safety. But that's not really the case, is it? Instead, the shepherd arrives at the sheepfold and calls the sheep away from safety of the walled off pen. And they follow the shepherd, not to the safety, but to the open wilderness, because that's where the shepherd always is. The shepherd isn't in the sheepfold. The shepherd is beyond its boundaries, beyond its walls, beyond a place of safety and comfort. The shepherd comes to drive out his sheep from the safety into pastures where there's abundant life. Abundant life is not necessarily a safe life, mind you. 
out beyond the sheep pen. There is most certainly green pastures and still waters, but there are also roaming predators, wolves, and bandits. There is also a valley shadowed by death. It reminds me a lot of being a parent of a teenager. Little by little, you let them go farther away, and you do bigger things in their lives that may scare them and you, like learning to drive. But you are there when they need you. Now, it's just our images of the shepherd we've sanitized and cleaned up. We've done it to the text as well. We sheepishly say that Jesus brings out all his own from the sheep pen. But the Greek is so much more interesting. The verb used here is actually the exact same verb the gospel writers use to describe the violent casting out of demons. The shepherd cast out the sheep from the safety of the sheep pen. Suddenly, these sheep who have heard the shepherd's voice are quite literally outcasts. In the Gospel of John's historical contest, this makes sense. Written after the destruction of the temple by the Roman military forces, John's Gospel is set amidst an intense violent conflict within Judaism, which resulted in the expulsion of the Jewish Christian from the synagogue. In other words, like the sheep in the story, early followers of Christ were cast out from the safety of the sheepfold. So this text could very well have offered some comfort to these outcast Jews who followed Christ by reminding them that Jesus was outside the sheepfold and all they had to do was continue to follow his voice to find good pasture to restore their souls. Still, it must have been terrifying and painful to have to leave the safe, safe sanctuary of the faith of their mothers and fathers. It must have hurt to have the doors of their religious institutions shut in their faces because of their beliefs. It must have been incredibly disorienting to feel like they no longer belonged in the faith that birthed their own faith. The Good Shepherd is not good because he fixes everything, but because he lays down his life for everyone, for those who fit in and for those who don't, for those who stay in the sheep pen and for those who are cast. The other sheep who do not belong in the sheepfold, Jesus said. Who are these other sheep in our community? All those who don't fit into dominant society. The people most in our community wouldn't consider normal, but still belong to Christ and hear Christ's voice. They are the LGBTQ community, liberals, people experiencing poverty, those suffering from mental illness, African Americans, Latinos, and other ethnic groups. How does it make us feel to be grouped in with this list? Do we feel like we belong with them? Are these our kind of people? Because if we don't belong, then there is something wrong with our spirituality. Think about this image of Jesus casting out the sheep from the sheep pen and calling them out to the pasture in the wilderness. How often in the Gospels does Jesus break back bread with the sinners and the outcasts and those society considered sinners? How often would Jesus hold these outsiders up as examples of profound faith, of how Jesus chose to despise to befriend? Remember when Jesus says that whenever we are hungry, the poor, the lonely, the disenfranchised, the outcasts, we are seeing Jesus himself. When we hear the voices of these outcasts in our society, those disenfranchised and marginalized? Do we hear that voice for what it is? The voice of Jesus, the voice of the shepherd, calling us out from the safety of the sheepfold to be a flock of the cast out. Now I'm not suggesting we sell our possessions and give them to the poor, 
though Jesus does. I'm not selling, suggesting we hold our possessions and money in common so that none of us will be in need, though that's how it was done in Acts, and that's how the early church functioned. I'm not suggesting we need to spend more time among the outcasts and the marginalized because it makes us good people and better Christians to serve those who need and lend a helping hand. To do so would miss the point of being cast out of the safety of the sheep pen. The point is not to do what is right or help others. The point is simply to be where the shepherd is. And the shepherd isn't in the sheep pen. As Lilla Watson, an Aboriginal woman in Australia, explained to well-intentioned folk coming to help the outcasts there, if you come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. That is the point. That in some way, this boundary-crossing shepherd is calling us to the idea that our liberation, our salvation, is tied up with the salvation and liberation of all people. And that is why the shepherd comes to the sheep pen and calls us out into the wild pasture. Because that is where salvation, abundant life, is waiting. Amen. I will be on vacation starting tomorrow until next Sunday. Marty Hammond will be here to fill in next Sunday. Are there any other announcements? Then let us sing our closing hymn, number 232, God Be With You. As you depart from this place, go with courage and go with trust that the God who created you is also the one who will sustain you and the one who will show you the way until we meet again. May you be filled with curiosity, wonder, and openness to God's tender leading. Amen.
Thank you.